Okay, this is your brief lecture on Chapter 16, Working in a Criminal Justice System. The criminal justice system is all of the parts of the United States system, whether that's the police, the court systems, prison systems, or community-based corrections, such as parole or probation. The programs and policies and agencies that are devoted to preventing and controlling crime, whether that's adjudication or rehabilitation, or monitoring during incarceration, okay? Crime is just a violation of what has been enacted by a society to be law, okay? It's something For something to be criminal, it has to be written down that it is a violation to do this, whether that would be trespassing or stealing or murder or something like that, okay? Um, there are certainly different types of crimes. You have the violent crimes, which is crimes against a person, like homicide, aggravated assault, uh, murder, murder, at rape, robbery. Robbery is stealing from a person. But this, the difference between robbery and a property crime is if you steal somebody's car from their driveway, that would be theft. That is not a violent crime. If you steal somebody's car, like you carjack them and you kick them out of their car while they're in it, that is a violent crime. That would be a robbery. Okay? So typically we have violent crimes and we have property crimes such as auto theft, larceny, which is stealing from a home or something like that, burglary. Arson is considered a property crime, but it is it is also very dangerous because of the fire that's involved with arson, but it is considered a property crime. There are also victimless crimes. They're not really victimless, but we call them this because the perpetrator and the victim are usually the same person. The most common victimless crimes would be illegal drug use, uh, illegal gambling, prostitution. Okay. In prostitution, the prostitute is at the greatest risk of harm from uh, her action, or his or her action. Okay. Corporate crime is whenever a business, it doesn't have to be a corporation, but a business commits a crime. They do something that is against the law, whether that is they illegally dumped waste out in the middle of a field or something like that, or they hid uh, safety information that led to people being harmed. A lot of corporate crime kind of takes the uh, guise of white collar crime, which people using their offices or their businesses, their place in society to illegally enrich themselves. Organized crimes like the mafia. There is a connection between organized crime and victimless crimes because they are victimless. They are many times very low on the police's priority list to stop. And, and that's the way society wants it. As a society, we would rather the police spend their time and concentrate on catching the murderers rather than prostitutes, okay? Organized crime is smart enough to figure this out, so they sort of specialize in prostitution, illegal drug use, illegal gambling, things like this. Hate crimes are crimes against a person because the person, the victim, is belongs to a specific group. That could be a racial group, a religious group, a cultural group, uh, sexual orientation, something like that. Their belonging to that group was an assistance to the perpetrator as far as targeting that particular person for that crime. Hate crimes uh, are very difficult to prove because you can prove that I did a crime. You know, you have DNA or evidence or something like this. For it to be a hate crime, you almost have to have the person admit to a judge or jury that, yes, I targeted this person because they were... Asian, or because they were gay, or because they were Baptist, or, or whatever the case might be. It's very hard to prove motive on that level, so hate crimes are actually a little bit difficult to prove. Now, who commits crime by gender? Men are much more likely to commit crimes than women are. Men commit about 80% of all crimes in the United States. For the 20% of crimes that are committed by women, a huge percentage of that are committed by younger women. Older women are much, much less likely to commit a crime. Um, men are often commit more violent crime, which should be kind of expected. We sort of expect men to be violent in our society. Uh, we encourage that to some degree. Uh, so that's just to be expected. Uh, African Americans are overrepresented in arrest statistics, but this probably more closely 
and logically correlates to income difference and social class difference rather than actual crimes committed. Okay, um, the poor are overrepresented as well, and a lot of this has to do with the ability to hire good legal representation if you are accused of a crime. So forensic social workers, social workers work in the prison system. Outside of a prison work, we can deal with mental competence. This would be working for the, in the court system, this person is able to stand trial. They understand the charges and things like that. Child custody rec recommendations, placement of del delinquent juveniles, advocating for victims and offenders, being an expert witness if that's called for in the particular trial. Within correctional facilities, this is where I worked for the majority of my social work career, was individual and group counseling, anger management, pre-release planning, because whenever a person is released on parole, you want to make sure that they have the best chance to be successful. So they need a job, they need a place to live, different things like that. Um, helping cope with substance abuse, because dealing with substance abuse while you're incarcerated is different than dealing with substance abuse out on the street. Uh, job placement, RIB sits for Rules Infraction Board. This would be for if a, somebody while they're incarcerated violates a, a prison rule that is not a law, a big enough law that you're going to get outside law enforcement involved. Modification of procedures for advocate for humane treatment within the prison systems. These are just some common areas where you'll see social workers being involved. Social workers are also involved in probation and parole, such as those would be community-based corrections. In those cases, a person either bypassed prison or they went to prison for a certain period of time and then were released. They're still going to be supervised, though, while they are on the street, either on probation or parole. Um, working in victim assistance programs or domestic violence shelters. This, in this case, if a, stu if a social worker is working in these places, you're working sort of tangently in the criminal justice system because people are there because people in their lives have broken the law and, and they've been a victim of that, most likely. You also find a lot of social workers working in juvenile corrections. Um, or status offenses. A status offense is a crime that is only a crime because a young person committed it. You think about like truancy. If you don't, as an adult, if I don't go to my job, I just get fired. It's not a crime, but we consider school to be required. So if a young person doesn't go to school, that is a truant. He is truant or she is truant. That is a status offense, and that is actually a crime. Poverty and economic deprivation can lead to a lot of juveniles being incarcerated, as well as some other individual factors such as mental health or other things like that. One thing I do want to point out to you, for the people that are interested in this, that's great. For the people who say that's a place I do, would never want to work, that's fine as well. But to, I've had some students who said we, these people have committed crimes, they don't necessarily deserve all this great treatment. I understand wanting to be harsh on people that have hurt other people. I totally get that. However, let's look at this from a very macro sense. Texas is well known as executing more people than the other 49 states combined. Okay, I don't know if that is actually factually accurate, but that is the rumor and the and the common belief amongst people here. Okay, true or not, doesn't really matter. Let's look at hard facts. Less than 1% of all people incarcerated in the United States will die in prison. Less than 1% of all people that are incarcerated in the United States will be executed. So that means whether by a, whether ex, uh, for by accident or on purpose, over 98% of all people that are ever incarcerated will be released. When they're going to be released, I would like them to be better people than they were when they first were incarcerated. Okay, so that is the main logical point I can use to justify good treatment programs within the prison is because they're going to be out soon, and they're going to be buying gas at the same place I, I buy gas, and they're going to be going to church at the same place as I go to church, and getting groceries at the same place that you and I are getting groceries. These people deserve respect, not just for being people, but because they're going to be let out, 
and we all want them to behave a little bit better than they did for whatever got them incarcerated in the first place. If you have questions about any of this, once again, please feel free to get in touch with me.